We are turning the wrong people into heroes today. Those are the victims. We're no longer turning these people that risk their entire life savings to start a business. In many cases, 90% of the time, doesn't work out. Lose a house, lose their cars, lose their marriage, divorce. Running a business is so hard and risky. But we're not turning these people into heroes. We're saying they're greedy. Today's guest is Patrick Bet David, who has an estimated net worth of about $200 million. He's a serial entrepreneur that runs the popular company and YouTube channel Valuetainment. He's interviewed everyone from Kobe Bryant and Mark Cuban to notorious mobsters and, of course, the current most controversial man on the planet, Andrew Tate, who we discuss. We go over the commonalities for super success, how to arrange discipline in your life. We talk about the potential Iran revolution and the current political state of America. It is a banger podcast, people. Enjoy. The way of Will John. What's up, people? We're back. A very special, very interesting guest for us today. Patrick Bet David, what's going on, man? How you doing? It's good to be on with you, man. It's good. To, I see the Napoleon in the back, KC. Are you a Kansas City fan? Fan. I, I, I am. I am KC, man. I'm from Kansas City. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah. I like it. So, there's plenty we could we could actually talk about, considering all the things that you've done. Considering most of our audience is guys on the come up, guys trying to figure out what they can do for their lives, how to become professional athletes, how they can be better in their lives, how they can get faster, stronger, all that stuff that, you know, has uh, a huge, huge importance on uh, their young lives or, you know, regardless, young, I say maybe 20, 30, these guys as well. So uh, we're probably going to get into more what you believe and all that stuff. Just a little later. How would you define yourself in a, in a short few words? If you could define yourself now, how do you define what you do, your mission, who you are? I mean, personal life is different than what I do professionally. As a professional, I'm an entrepreneur uh, and I like to run businesses. I'm an operator. And now after being an operator for 20 some years and still operating nine businesses, now I've turned into an investor and I also run a media company, podcast, you know, we create content. We've been doing that for a few years. But that's what I would identify myself as, as an entrepreneur. Obviously, most of these guys are probably going to be aware of Valuetainment and uh, all the conversations and all the people you've talked to. <clears throat> so why don't we start there? Um, you've spoken to God knows how many of some of the greatest people in, in, in a lot of fields. And one of the things we like to do is kind of dissect uh, what these people have done. And I know this is part of your advice from your book as well uh, to kind of imitate or at least gain some sort of knowledge from these guys that have done great things. So of all the people that you've talked to, if you could, and I know this seems like an impossible task, bring out some sort of commonalities in what makes these guys a success, whether everyone is going to be a high performance individual or not, I think is irrelevant. I think uh, having personal success in your life and achieving your, your potential uh, is what matters, regardless if you want to be Elon Musk or if you just want to be the guy who's, you know, the best chair maker or whatever it is. So could you pick something out of all of those people that makes them win? It's, it's tough to do that. So if you're talking about out of all the people I've interviewed or, or all the peak performers and winners, because I've interviewed some random people from FBI, CIA agents to mobsters to, you know, billionaires to Kobe Bryant to, you know, um, military leaders. But if you're talking peak performers, um, you know, on any given day, your best day versus their best day, you'd, you'd, you'd be able to hang with them. Best day against best day. But what makes these guys different is it's not about the best day versus the best day. Their decade beats your decade. Their decade beats your two decades. Their week beats your week. Their year beats your year, not the day. A lot of people want to brag about how hard of a work they had how hard they worked or how hard of a week they had or how hard of a month or a year. These guys do it for a couple of decades. I mean, you know, to be able to last that long, their level of endurance, their level of stamina, their level of I'm not the, the obsessive personality of I'm not giving up the stubborn personality that they have, you know, because at the end of the day, you, you know, when you sit down, I had a conversation, with one of our guys, never forget this. We're at El Fornayo in San Diego. One of our guys comes up to us. This is 12 years ago, maybe 13 years ago. And he says, Pat, I'm going to be your biggest guy in the company. I'm like, really? I want to be the biggest. 
I said, how much are you making right now? So I'm making 50K a year. I said, talk to me when you're making a quarter million to see if you're still as fired up. So he makes a quarter million. He's still fired up. I said, talk to me when you're making a half. Half. Still fired up. Million. Still fired up. Million and a half with two million and a half in a bank. They eventually slow down. Uh -huh. Because th the point is, this, this whole journey of life we're on, you're about to find out if it's all about money, if it's all about fame, if it's all about just, you know, once I get to this point, I'm going to cruise, I'm going to go on cruise control, or if it's truly about a massive vision or a cause. Big thinkers, it takes a decade or two to identify who they really are. At the beginning stages, everybody is impressive. You know, a matter of fact, some of the most impressive people are the ones that eventually slow down, and some of the least impressive people are the ones that are going to go for 20, 30 years. And it may take us a decade or two. If you think about social media and content creation, YouTube, for instance, it's been around for how long? I don't know the exact timeline, 06, 04, 05. Some year like that is when mm. YouTube really started taking off. And some of the content creators started creating content during 2007. So we were very quick to pick the winners. That guy's the winner. It's this guy's show. It's that guy. It's this guy. It's that guy. It's PewDiePie. No, no, it's this motivational guy. No, it's that motivational guy. Mr. Beast is killing everybody today. You know, he's oh. killing everybody today. Podcast used to be, you know, uh, uh, all these other names we would talk about. Joe Rogan is dominating the game today, right? You know, business content was all about these handful of names we would look at. Valuetainment is, you know, so you, you have this other guy, then Al, you know, all these new names now coming up. And it's going to take 20 years to find out. So the difference between those guys and everyone else, they, their vision is real. And no matter how much money you pay them, they're not slowing down because it's not about money. And I find that incredibly interesting just due to the sense and due to the fact of maybe how I'm wired. And I, I'm obviously really curious for how this plays out in my life in general. And the only um, correlation I have for that is as an athlete being 37, having played as a pro since I was 19, having decided at 16 to learn 10 languages. Now I'm on nine, learning my 10th now, realizing that. Damn. I underestimated. Good for you. I mean, we say good for me, but I mean, you know, when you want to push and when it doesn't have anything to do, not necessarily with money, because I don't think that there's anything wrong with trying to and pushing to earn money for what money can do for you, your community, your people, all that stuff. But there's a weird thing that happens when you get that mission implanted in your heart and soul. Um, and it doesn't seem to matter to me at all. If someone asked me, would you do this, uh, you know, if you could start all over, 100%. Uh, would you, you know, would you do this for nothing? hundred percent. I don't want to, I'm not going to, <laughs> you gotta pay me, but I'm, you know, I, I, I would do this. And, and so, uh, I, it's something that we try to get across to the guys that want to be pros, because just like your, your guy who's like, I want to be a, I want to be a big time. I'll be your guy. I'm gonna be your homeboy, you know? And then he gets to 1.5 and he's, he's done, you know, uh, you know, good for you pat on the back. But the same thing happens when guys want to be pros, they say they want to be good. They say they want to do it. They get to the training. One knock happens. One coach tells you, you suck. He says, you're shit. And then they, they crumble and they say, oh, it's, it's not going to happen for me. I mean, the amount of people we have, the amount of friends that I have with the extreme potential too. I mean, talk extreme, you know, one, one roadblock done, you know? So it's important that the motivations are there. And the question that I want to ask just as a follow-up to what you said is uh, people, it's a cliche now to talk about motivation versus discipline, but it's a really important fact that you have systems set up to allow you to, to create this discipline in your life. Do you have anything? Could you say anything to the people that want to like, you know, there are going to be people out there that want to do it, that don't know how, right. Or that don't know where to start, how to get some sort of discipline that allows me to be the best. Yeah. I mean, uh, um, you know, how to get the discipline. Uh, look, it's, it's four things I talk about, right. Outwork, out, improve, out, strategize, outlast, outlast. I put it the last one because it's going to take a while for us to find out. How long you can last? And number one, the easiest one is outwork, but it's not enough. You know, and for someone that wants to develop discipline, how do you improve developing discipline? You start off with keeping small promises. Nothing I'm going to say in this area is going to be anything out of the ordinary. Start off by keeping small promises. You know, think about this mouth. Every time something comes out of your mouth, we have a similar system to Experian, TransUnion, and Equifax, okay? 
if you go to a bank wanting a $5 million loan, the first thing they're going to do is what? Okay, why do you want $5 million? I'm trying to buy this commercial property. Fantastic. What's the usage of this commercial property? I'm going to use it for myself. Excellent. Let's run a report. They run a report. They take a 1003 from you. How much money you got in the bank? It's $2,000. What's your income for the year? $180,000. What's your credit score? 680, 693, 628. You ain't getting the loan. You ain't getting the loan, right? So, but why aren't they giving you loan? Is it unfair? Is it because, you know, they don't like you? No, because your credit score says you don't keep your promises. That's how simple it is. So 20 years ago, I ran a credit. I have it till today. I had a 484, 495, and a 499 credit score. That's a pretty bad credit score. I kept every single file of what credit cards I owned, MBNA, Discover, Amex. I had all these things that I had to pay for. And I said, you know, I'd go to a place. I'd like to finance this car. We're not going to let you finance this car. Why not? You're, you're, have you looked at your credit score? <sighs> Nobody going to let you finance this car. I remember one time, well, I went to try to rent a car from Hertz. They didn't give me the car. Why aren't you giving me the car? You have 21 speeding tickets. Got it. So that means you don't know who I am, but my credit is telling you what my track record is for driving. And my credit is telling you what my track record is for making payments. You're right. Let me get to work. So I got to work and I sat down. Hmm. I created an Excel spreadsheet. This is in 2003, 2003 to be exact, 19 years ago. And in this Excel okay. spreadsheet, I put all my credit cards, all my checking accounts, my saving account, and anything I had of value, which I didn't have a lot at that time. Every 18th, I would run a true credit, uh, my own credit on all three. It was like 19 bucks a month. So I would run the credit and I would put the score, boom, 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 boom. I started tracking it, uh, uh, you know, because you got to inspect what you expect. So I started tracking every single thing that I was doing, my credit score. And I said, let me see which one's got the highest credit uh, uh, per, uh, interest I'm paying. This one's 29%. Oh, my God. Let's pay this $3,200 off. Yeah. This one's got 28%. This one's like, this one's 13%. That's going to last. Everything became intentional six months later, 12 months later, 24 months later. I paid everything off. And then my credit score went from 484, 495, 499 to 620 to 680 to 750 to now 800 plus where I have massive contract with some of the largest 50, 100, 200 billion dollar insurance company because I kept my word. So discipline starts off with you start to keep your promises and looking at this as a credit score. If you say you're going to do something, do it or don't say at all. Do not commit if you're not going to be coming through. And it's not an easy thing to do, Will. I mean, you know this. We, we at, the, at the end of the day, none of us are robots. None of us are machines. You know, uh, a, even a Brady with seven championships, he still second guesses himself. Am I done? He talks about it openly in Man in the Arena. Jordan's not a robot. He's not a machine. Kobe, the night his Achilles heel got torn. I don't know if you remember this interview. I asked him in the interview when he and I were sitting down together. I said, Kobe, you remember when you had your Achilles? He says, yes. I said, there's a scene where you're being interviewed in the locker room and a guy's asking you a question. And he says, well, Kobe, you know. We know they say the average recovery is 18 months, but we're talking about you. And, and you got emotional and you didn't want to answer it. I said, what were you thinking about? He says, because I didn't know if I wanted to go through with it because I know how hard it is. I mean, even a Kobe Bryant that we call Black Mamba, everybody's a human being. We all are being tested constantly, you know? And then the, the next level as you're going at it, the, the level of, Differences, you know this. I mean, you run a channel with a million subscribers. You, you, you've done a lot of stuff yourself. It's not like you don't deal around a lot of peak performers. But the gap then becomes so small. Where it's like, how small is it? It's so small that we're not, again, we're not going to know that for a while. But uh, yeah, to start discipline is start off by keeping a word. When you say you're going to do something, work on that. And then eventually you start having trust in the words that come out of your mouth. And, and the fact that you tracked your results, I mean, is some, it's, it's, it's actually something, and to be honest, I mean, everything that you said is obviously so powerful. Like you said, it's, it's, it's nothing new, truly, but it is, you know, when, when, it, when it hits the right, when it touches you in the right way, when, when the person hears it at the right time, that's the thing that gets them going. And tracking results is something that um, <clears throat> as a young guy, as a younger guy, I definitely shied away from. Uh, I don't know if that was fear. I don't know if that was laziness, but whatever happened, something turns when you decide there's a point that happens when you decide that the, the dreams that are kind of hazy, 
you know, that are there that you want them, that they're going to be defined, clarified. And I want this, I'm going to have this. And then when that happens, you have to, you have to start tracking results. I have bad credit. Well, how do you get good credit? You don't just trip and fall into good credit. Right. You don't trip and fall into wealth. You don't trip and fall into greatness. It happens on purpose. It happens because people show up and people do the right things and they do them over and over again. And it's a simple message to preach, but it's a very hard one to follow, you know, uh, in practice. I want to, I want to shift slightly, um, just because we haven't talked about it and because it's also, it's, it's part of current events. We'll, we'll come on back to, to some of this more success rate and success stuff, but I've played, uh, I've got some, you're Armenian, uh, correct. And I've got some very good Armenian friends, uh, from the football world. Uh, you're a Mosisian, Robert Arzumanian. These guys played on the Armenian national team and we played together in, in, in a few places. And, uh, so I know what's going on also. And I know you're, you're, you were born in Iran or Iran is what we would say out here outside. I'm outside of the U S right now. Um, I got to ask, cause this is a, it's a huge curiosity for me for what's going on there and the changes and the shifts that could happen in the middle East. I didn't get to see all of the video that you made. It's kind of been you addressing uh, what's going on for the people that don't know. Maybe you could just briefly say what's up. I don't know how much uh, has, has changed in these, but I'm very curious what you think, how this is going to play out. I know it's speculation, but is this the time that we see a true massive change in that region, in this place? Uh, so both of them, let's talk Iran and let's talk Armenia. So uh, I don't know if your audience is a political audience or it's a purely a sports audience. I'm going to share some stuff and some of your audience may not like it, but I tell you, this is purely my views and I'm very comfortable with it. So look, here's how it works. In a family, uh, say there's a man that's very abusive, okay? And around the kids, say there's three brothers and there's a wife, the mom, and the father is super abusive, comes home at night, starts drinking at 5.30. By 8.30, he's drunk. He starts hitting mom, hitting the boys. Just got that kind of an attitude, right? Okay. And then eventually, one of the three brothers stands up to the dad. And that brother stands up, and they go at it. And usually, dad beats him up. This one time, the brother stands up, hits dad in the face. Dad drops. Calls him a drunk. Calls him this. Stand up. Be a man. You don't ever lay your hand on my mom ever again. You don't ever lay your hand on the brothers again. If you do, I'm going to do this to you. And the dad's like, holy shit. I can't do this anymore. And he says, if you keep doing this, I'm going to move mom out with the brothers. And I'm going to get my own place because I'm making my own money right now. And you can't do shit about it. That father for the first time, the bully, has officially been exposed. Next day. Dad comes home. Maybe he doesn't even come home because he's so embarrassed. A week later, he comes home. Son doesn't say anything. The two brothers are sitting there worried to see what's going to happen. Maybe dad goes to have a drink and he goes to his room. Everybody's waiting to see if he's going to do anything or not. Nothing happens. Next night, nothing happens. Next night, nothing happens. This goes on for six months. Doesn't do anything. Six months later, the brother is moving out because he's joining the army. When his brother goes to join the army, he calls back to check in, and he realizes those habits are back again. And he's hitting the other two brothers and the mom, and the brother can't do nothing about it because he's in boot camp and it's 12 weeks. Then it's AIT, it's eight weeks. He can't do nothing for five weeks. He comes back. When he comes back, he looks at everybody sees the abuse, sees that it's going on. At this point, he has to make a decision. If you harm your dad too much, you're going to jail. You'll be kicked out of the army. You have to move those people out or leave them in or teach one of your brothers to stand up for yourself. But the oldest brother that's staying behind, he's only 12 years old. He can't go up against a 52-year-old man. So what do you do in this situation? In this situation, you have to give the wife, uh, your mom, courage to leave your dad. And if she does, a new man has to show up and when the new man shows up, he protects her, or he has to go to alcohol to want to change his stuff. What the hell does this have to do with Armenia and Iran? Let me explain to you what this has to do with Armenia and Iran. When America is no longer seen as being extremely powerful and feared, bullies show up. Guess what? Putin wasn't doing nothing for four years. All of a sudden, he sees an opening. He says, wait a minute, what? Let's go after Ukraine. Why now? No one's going to do anything. Afghanistan, look what happened. $84 billion of equipment left behind. The Taliban got it. 
America is not going to do anything. They're going to leave it alone. Iran, don't worry about it. The revolution, U.S. is not going to let us have the revolution because we're going to have the nuclear. We're going to get what we want. Yesterday, Biden gave him seven billion dollars. Right now, they're talking about how Mm -hmm. we have to renegotiate the nuclear. So this doesn't happen because that's why it's the economy issue. It's not the economy issue. Women in Iran are sick of it. And I'll give you a little bit of history about this. I'm a, I'm a guy that was born in Iran, October 18, 1978, which was the peak of the revolution. When my mother, her water broke and they were taking my mom to the hospital, my dad was held up by security, middle of the night saying, what the hell are you doing? He says, my wife's water broke. They escorted my mom to the hospital. I was born. Mm-hmm. At the peak of the revolution, 9 million people revolting. So I'm born. Three months later, Shah's in exile. Jimmy Carter and Kissinger said they would help him out. They would never let the revolution happen. U.S. never helped that. They got out of the way. The people were able to revolt. Nine million people revolted. They kicked the Shah out. And they thought Iran was going to be a better place. The moment the Shah was out, it was a shit show for 40 years till today. Seven wars. Millions of people died. And a guy named Khomeini comes in and takes over in February, give or take second or third of 79. He has no clue how to run a military. They either kill some of the generals or some of them escape from Iran and they keep looking for these guys. Women's age goes from 18 or 15 to be able to marry to 13 to nine years old. You know, in Iran, a nine year old girl is considered a woman that can marry a 52 year old man if they permit it. That's catastrophic. When I explained this thing to my kids yesterday, they said, you mean to say Senna can marry somebody in three years? She's only six years old in Iran. In Iran, they think it's okay. My son's like, that That doesn't make any sense. I said, brother, I know it doesn't make any sense, son, but it's what's going on in Iran. So finally, March 7th of 79, Khomeini says everybody has to wear a hijab, a woman that has to cover themselves up. Because to Khomeini, if you show your hair to him, that's a way a woman's being naked, right? And women are like, what are you talking about? I'm just, it's my hair. No, you got to cover it up because you're naked and you're encouraging men to do something to you. And it's not really the man's fault. It's really your fault because you shouldn't expose yourself that much. Fine. Fast forward, Iran got a little bit looser and a little bit looser. Well, the last guy that got elected, Raisi, who most of the country doesn't trust and they hate, he had a whole massacre of what he did in 88. You got to know the history of it. It's not, uh, not the nicest guy. So lowest turnout ever in the election since 1979 because wow. nobody really came out to vote for this guy. They just kind of said it's a democracy. It's not really a democracy. On August 15, he announces every woman needs to wear a hijab, again, tight. And we're going to have surveillance and camera. If you don't do it, you're going to get arrested. And if you go on social media talking about the hijab, you're going to go arrest, get arrested and you're going to go to jail. Well, that's August 15th. So if you notice, August 15 is six weeks ago. So all of a sudden you're seeing all these videos, women burning their scarves. Why are they doing this? Because that just got extreme on August 15th Mm. with Raisi, and he just got elected last year. So long story short, women are doing this, doing this, doing this. Then one lady named Mahsa Amini, who is in the middle of a store, and you you see the video, her hair is showing up. They come in, they arrest her. They throw her in, her head hits the door. They beat her up. She goes to the hospital, dies three or three days later. She was 22 years old. And next thing you know, there's an uprising of people wanting to protest against this you know, Mm -hmm. theocracy, dictatorship that they have going on there. And they're saying, we're done with it. And it got bigger and bigger and bigger. I think it's day 15 or day 16 or day 17 today. I was in LA a couple of days ago, 7,000 people in Irvine, tens of thousands of people in LA. Worldwide, Iranians are protesting to support the women of Iran of what is going on. And uh, it's tragic. But if US comes in and helps out, the government of Iran revolution will not be taking place. This is where Mm. U.S. needs to stay out of it, but they're not going to do that. They keep helping out. They make the government stronger and stronger and stronger, Mm -hmm. and that's not going to help them. And on the other side with Armenia, Armenia is a different story because Azerbaijan is also noticing that U.S. is doing nothing about it. They're bullying Armenia because they can, and Putin can help out Armenia, but he doesn't really fully help out Armenia to the best of his abilities because he's got alliances with Turkey, and Turkey supports Azerbaijan. Mm. It's a very technical issue, but look. The, the biggest factor of why this mess is going on today is because the world doesn't fear America. When you talk about fear and respect, there's one thing America has always been known. We've always been respected, but we've always been feared. Mm. The times we were not feared was under Carter and today. We are not feared today. And when we're not feared and respected, bullies show up. And unfortunately, this is a perfect climate for bullies to go bully 
and they're getting away with literally murder. I'm not sure if you're aware of this uh, former intelligence officer from the CIA, Andrew Bustamante. Have you heard that name? He's been flying yeah, around the social he media. Was here last week with me. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and he's a good guy. Perfect. Yeah. All right, he's a great guy. Yeah. So he, uh, and he probably mentioned this. So we, we spoke to him maybe a month ago. Uh, and uh, because you touch on the fact that there's no, let's say bully, there's nobody, there's, sorry, not bully. There's no overarching protector in the world. There's no person to kind of, let's make sure we don't step off. He estimates that uh, China is going to invade Taiwan. He even put a date on it just due to the fact that he could see what seems to be possible instability happening before our next election with what's going on and estimates that that's a perfect time. Also with a regime change, possible regime change, uh, let's say, uh, it's a perfect time to attack someone. And uh, because what are we supposed to do? Like the you know, new government coming in, what are we going to send yeah. troops that well? And also we have a current track record, like you said, currently at least, of kind of been like, meh, we're kind of meh. You know, it's not to say that America doesn't care. That's not necessarily, that's not really what you're saying. It's to say that to step up and do something. And it's not that the people don't care either. There's something else going on i don't know if you agree with that that possible thing and i would love to just get is just as a as a and by the way everybody here is we make sure guys are well-rounded you can't just be kicking a ball around the field you got to have an understanding of your world around you so we can talk about whatever we want but i'd love to also get your current understanding and state of how things are in america as it is because it is also different the place that we're in yeah i mean look covid changed a lot of things because when 9 11 happened nobody cared if you were white black hispanic asian republican democrat independent educated not nobody cared they're just like listen you got kids stuck over there i'm gonna come and help you out because it wasn't politicized it was mm. it was just hey let's unite you know when 9 11 happened i don't know if you remember the when uh yeah yeah uh poppy it's so funny i was on a flight with uh big poppy just yesterday coming back from la mm. and uh you know, he comes into game, you know, and I know so, you know, and, 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 you know, what's the other story with President Bush comes out, throws the first pitch, Yankees. America was just united, man. We really were united. I want to say the last time America was super united was probably 9-12, a day after 9-11. Very true. And it brought us together. You know, it, it, the conversations were more about what we got along with and what we agreed on. This is what we disagreed on where, where what COVID did is, and by the way, it was one simple adjustment. All, all we had to do is one adjustment with COVID and we didn't do it. All we had to do with COVID is to say it's China's fault, not America's fault. We would have been united, but no, we said it's America's fault. And what that did is that divided everybody. And then everything became about division. Like, hey, are you vax? Are you taking a vaccine? Right. It's my business, bro. Are you, you're not taking it? We can't, I can't see you. Right. Now, literally, we had one of our relatives that we had guys that are going to L.A. to visit family. And they said, are you vaccinated? We're not. We can't have you come over for family gathering. What are you talking about? What are you talking about? So, and by the way, keep this part of mind. My nanny has been vaccinated. She lives with us. She's like our grandma. We love this woman. She's like everything to us. Sure. She got both vaccinations. She got the first one, second one, third one, fourth one, all the boosters. My dad, same thing, 80 years old, same thing. Our family, mm. some are, some not. Nobody cares. There's mutual respect. No one cares. You did it. You didn't do it. Hey, go do your own research. If you think it makes sense for you, go for it. You, you know, you do what you got to do with it. We never made it mandatory at any of our companies. And we never judged you if you did or if you didn't. It was very simple. And it's your business. You keep it to yourself. But it became so politicized the last two years that, man, I mean, very weird types of division. But I will tell you, this doesn't work. This philosophy doesn't work because I think naturally, we naturally are unifiers. It's in our DNA. When people try to divide us, at first we'll fall for it, maybe for three months, maybe for six months. Maybe for 12 months, maybe for 24 months, maybe even three to five years. But eventually we're like, I cannot believe what you did to divide me and my brother, man. We're best of buddies. You screwed up my best friend right. and I's relationship for five years. You know what you did to my marriage. You know what you did to our family. I can't even believe that you confused the hell out of me. I'm not falling for that. Hey, I love you. We're good. I don't care if you're this. I don't care if you're that. Right, right. Let's just get along. So. I think it's catastrophic what we did. I think the effects of it, we won't see for a long time. I think a lot of good friends are no longer hanging out with each other because it became so politicized. 
But I think long term, the unifiers are going to show up and they're going to bring everybody together. It's, whether it's, it's going to happen now, a year from now, 12 months from 24 months from now, they're going to show up. Yeah, I mean, I actually I, I agree with that 100 uh, percent. There is something to be said uh, about humans wanting to be unified. We are a species that does want to have good human loving connections and just good connections in general with strangers and people that, you know, like you said, it didn't matter after 9-11 where you came from, what race you were, what gender, this, that, vax, anti-vax, all that seems like massive nonsense now in this world. And I also want to say the fact that personal responsibility, in my opinion, just seems to have taken a back seat for a lot of people, which I don't understand because this is, I, I'm a guy who's still a young guy, you know, in my, in my head, right? I still have this thoughts, you know, I, 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 and and I cannot, for the life of me, understand why personal responsibility is taking a back seat in the world right now. Who is responsible for you, what you do, how you succeed, what you're going to do? Uh, the, I mean, regardless of if you need help, you can still ask for help. You can still need help. Being, having personal responsibility for yourself doesn't mean you can't ask for help. Doesn't mean you don't need help. We all need help at some times, right? And so I cannot understand why that's not being preached as the forefront, because it doesn't make sense to me how we're going to pick up a society in general, whether you're a man, woman, uh, you know, kids can start to learn personal responsibility as they should very, very early. You know, why did you pour that out? You shouldn't have poured that out. There's no more left now. Okay. You know? And so I, I, I try to get this behind people to try because the excuses that people want to say and want to believe they're usually bullshit. Whether that has to do with what you want to do in your life uh, or uh, the reason why you couldn't, you know, you couldn't go here, or couldn't play here, or couldn't make this money or all this stuff, even if you have legitimate excuses. And I think you've probably seen this and I've at least seen this from the from the great players that I've played with, from the great people that I've spoken to just in, in the short time that we've had this this podcast, even when it looks like they got screwed over, they still blame themselves. You know, I've read some of Kobe stuff. I've read some of Michael Jordan's stuff. Even when it looks like, you know, I had the flu, you had everything in your favor to be like, I shouldn't have done it. They still blame themselves. Yep. They still figure out a way to say, what could I have done in that position? And I don't understand why that isn't the prevalent mentality in society. And it's my perfect segue into a person who's quite controversial in this. <laughs> and I watched the good long podcast. I don't think I think I still have maybe an hour left of you speaking to Andrew Tate, um, who is controversial in many sort of ways for many people. And I even saw the reaction uh, that you made which I 100% agree with, which is I don't understand why you wouldn't want to have a discussion with someone, whoever they are, to let them put their platform out there. If they're stupid, they're going to hang themselves yeah. when they're talking about how dumb it is, you know, for whatever it is their reason. Let them hang themselves. They'll do it. Ask them the question. And so I, I want to get your take as well on Tate, the whole thing, what you believe, the good, the bad, just whatever, you know. Yeah, you know, it, it, it's funny you say that. I like how you said about asking for help. I wrote this down. There's a difference between asking for help and being helpless, okay? We all ask for help, but none of us are helpless. You can do something about your life. Now, you know, some of the people living in Iran are helpless in certain things they're experiencing. Yes, there are certain situations where a bully bullies, and that bully needs to be bullied. You know, the bully needs to be pushed out where he can't be abusing people. I agree with that. That's true helpless in some cases. But 99% of people can do something about their lives. In regards to Andrew Tate, I think Andrew Tate is a showman who has strong beliefs, who's an incredible communicator. He could have been a comedian. His method of making, uh, you know, creating humor is very unique. It's subtle. You laugh. He's entertaining. He's witty. He's got all of that stuff going on. And he's learned how to get under people's skins, a certain community skin. And he keeps pushing the envelope and pushing the envelope and pushing the envelope until eventually people are sitting there saying, we got to silence this guy. But, uh, you know, we launched this app, Manect, and this app, Manect, where you can have a 15 minute call with uh, uh, Andrew Tate. You can literally call Andrew Tate and have a 15 minute FaceTime with him. Uh, you know, guy did it the other day. He posted on TikTok. It got a few million views. It's Minect, M-I-N-N-E-C-T, right? Minect? I've seen and it. I said, yeah. hey, hey, pick whatever dollar amount you want to do to charge per minute. Let's see what happened. If I told you how many people want to talk to this guy worldwide with their backgrounds, business, you know, celebrities, salespeople, people that are married, that are going through issues where husband and wife want to have a conversation with the guy, you'd be amazed how many people just want to have that conversation to see what's your point of view on this. And again, you don't have to agree with them. 
you know, for the longest time, I would bring communists on my podcast back to back to back. No one's ever interviewed more communists on their podcast than I have. And I'm a capitalist. But I would bring these communists and I would sit down and talk to them. One of the guys I brought is the guy. I don't know if you remember the story where the guy went around and said, I went from paying myself this much to everybody on my company makes $70,000 a year. And that's all I'm paying myself. And I was like, what a noble guy, you know, he pays everybody 70K uh, per year. And he's a great, fantastic socialist. Mm. This is how all these other companies need to do. So I brought him on the podcast one day. Okay. And his, I think his name is Dan Price. Mm. I brought him on the podcast, by the way, which by the way, courageous to come on the podcast. He said, sure. I said, so you pay everybody 70 grand a year? Yes. I said, what's the company's top line revenue? He gave the number. I said, what's the company's profits? It's around this number. Yeah. I said, man, this is a $100 million company. It is. And he seems very proud about it. I said, so you have 200 employees? Yes. Who owns this company? He says, I do. I said, oh, you own 100% of it. Of course, I own 100% of it. I said, why don't you take 100% of the company and give your 200 employees a half a percent of the company to make it really equal? Mm. Should have seen the look on his face. <laughs> well, well, no, no that wouldn't. It, it wouldn't uh, I'm like, oh, uh. I got you. So you're the guy worth 100 million because you own the company. Everyone's worth 70K because that's what they're paying them. So it's a good marketing campaign. Right. But you're still the guy that's a heck of a millionaire. Not kind of cool. Which, by the way, well deserved. I don't have a problem with you. I don't sure. have $100 right. million. Dollars. More power to you. Go for it. Yeah. But the messaging, the way it was delivered, is this is such a, you know, incredible, noble, active, you know, CEO to give us money, which he didn't. He kept the equity. So then the audience sat there and said, I agree with Pat. I agree with Dan. It doesn't matter. The audience got a chance to make a decision for themselves, whether I have leaks in my arguments or whether he does. But for you not to give them the limelight and the camera and then to speak, and then you can sit there and say, I don't agree with this guy. The former one of the members of Parliament of Turkey. Two weeks ago, look how proud this man is. He posts a video on his Twitter account with a couple hundred thousand followers. And you know what he says? He says, I just want to remind the Armenian people, don't forget what we did to your people. We can make you disappear of history and geography. You're starting to really push our patience. He says this in a video, posts it on Twitter, and it starts taking off. I retweeted it so people can see it. People ask me, shouldn't that guy be banned? I said, according to Twitter's guidelines, they should be banned. But you know what? I'm kind of glad they're not. Why? Because he just validated that the Armenian genocide happened. Mm. And he just validated how brutal they are to the innocent people of Armenia and let the world decide this is who they are. Do you agree with these types of leading people? No. Then, then don't sit there and second guess, well, Turkey is not really like that. When a member of parliament from Turkey just said it and retweeted it on a verified account with who he is, now go make up your mind. You can't now say, well, he doesn't really mean that. You can't say that. He said it. He yeah. meant it. That's what he said. So I, I think, you know, what you said is very important. Leave him on. If you disagree, let him get exposed. And then everybody gets called out, whether he's right, wrong, or whatever it may be. But, uh, yeah, look, I, again, I think bad ideas lose. I think uh, uh, hitting women is a bad idea. I think abusing your kids is a bad idea. I think forcing women to wear a hijab is a bad idea. I think overtaxing small business owners that need the money to create jobs is a bad idea. I think shutting down restaurants during COVID when you called it essential and non-essential and 50 million people lost jobs and it, we had to print six, 10, 12 trillion dollars of money that hit the economy and the economy is now 29,300 Dowas, S&P's at 3651. Those are bad ideas. And the best thing about bad ideas they may look good for a month, two months, three months, but eventually all bad ideas will be exposed due to the help of social media and people like yourself who will host a guy like me where your audience is going to sit there and say, I don't like this guy, but he made sense. I like this guy. I never thought about it this way. I never thought about that way. And then they have to decipher through all this stuff. And so let me go do some research. That guy, member of parliament, really said this. Let me go see this Twitter, Armenian genocide. The guy really said this. Wow. Let me go. And, you know, and then we, we keep getting smarter. So, again, as, as crazy as the times are today, gradually bad ideas are getting exposed left and right. And it's, it's hilarious that you say that, uh, especially now. We had a guy named Uri Geller on. Uh, I don't know if you know who he is. Um, 
and controversial guy once again same thing happened when we posted up now th- this guy's got a whole whole bunch of claims that i couldn't even for the life of me verify in any sort of way whatsoever i i really could care less let, let me talk to someone who's an interesting individual let me see what he says at the end of the day he had a message you know i gave him a chance at the end to just kind of speak what his message was it was a message of you know personal belief going for what you what you want getting educated all, all sorts of good things we posted that we posted that part out came all the trolls to come talk. how could you talk to this person i've lost all my respect for you will now nah, i can't believe that you're talking to a person of this nature and 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 that's you know that's fine I, I i normally wouldn't respond but it made sense to respond to keep it up in the front and i pinned it there just to say that what in this video do you disagree with that he said what is it which part of get an education take personal responsibility you know do, do you disagree with i don't understand and so until we can get past that and i, and I think it may be uh, you know uh, i think it may be one of those things that we live in this time where the people have a voice social media being a great tool that it is does allow for some people who are easily offended or looking for attention or whatever it is to speak out quickly without maybe really truly analyzing what they what they think there's something they said they just say this we i mean we have a we do have an issue with that in society with the amount of information that we all have to deal with it's something that's there you know so in, in that sense but i i also just really quickly on the socialist communist uh capitalist point i am i played i spent a lot of my career in in scandinavia uh where highly socialist countries probably the most successful uh of these you know on on the planet uh because they have some level of economic prosperity i've never really taken the time to go deeply into what i think and and want to understand about this but you know growing up in america growing up with that uh understanding of pushing to be number one pushing to explore innovate you know this individual belief and stuff like that i've found in my career that i would never have wanted someone to have handed me anything for the things that i've whether it's language learning football you know, building a business, you know, all this stuff. I didn't, I, I'm a college dropout. I dropped out. I got to figure out all this other stuff myself because I made a decision to go play pro. It turned, it worked out great for me, you know, but if someone had, if I dropped out and it didn't work out, I wouldn't want somebody to say, it's, a, it's all good here. We got a hundred K for you sitting right here. You're all good. We got you covered, man. What kind of a man does this guy turn into, you know, at, at the end of the day? Where do you stand on this sense? I mean, I understand that you're a capitalist in that, but is that the reason that's driving? Because I know there have been a lot of, whether they're pundits, philosophers, wherever, that have, that have debated this point. What's really driving you? What's driving the site? Why, why is America innovative? Why is this? What, does China have a chance, you know, uh, considering that they're not, they're not at the front end? Do they, is there another way? I've had all these strategists on the, the podcast as well to talk about the dangers of what could happen if China gets going. And what do you, what do you think in that end? Listen, proxy wars work, divide and conquer works, gaslighting works, disinformation works, pitting people against each other works, deceptive way of telling a story over and over and over again until you think it's really true works. These are all uh, uh, methods and strategies that work. You know, I never said it's, it's good. I never said it's honorable. I just said they work mm. and people will use it against America constantly. Unfortunately, America forgot you know, what they stood for, you know, what they did, because, you know, China's how many thousands of year year old? Uh, how, how old are some of these empires? How old is America? America's what, 1776, that's 24, 22, uh, 246 years old, whatever the age is, 246 years old, yeah, 246 years old. Mm. In 246 years, we've been able to whoop everybody's butt that's been around for 1,000, 2,000 years. Maybe we do something right. Maybe the level of innovation on what technologies we've used, maybe we are doing something right. Companies, products that the world uses that was invented in America, China, that brings the, these companies from America to China, they leave them there for six, 12 months to take their technology and all their software and all their, you know, and then they do it over there because that's part of the agreement. And they said, man, just copy what America does, copy what America does, copy what America does. Well, whoever is being copied is the OG. And America is the OG that's done it the way they've done it. Everybody wants to copy America. Everybody wants to come to America. You know, when all these people are complaining about how much America sucks, well, let me tell you, America's no longer this and America's no longer that. Really? Yes. Why did 2 million immigrants cross the border in the center? Why, why, why did they cross the border? 
<laughs> why are why are these people coming to America? Why aren't they going to Venezuela? They can go to Venezuela. Why aren't they going to Argentina? Why don't you go to Brazil? Why don't you go to some of these? Why are you coming to America? If America sucks, why is America leading in immigration around the world? I had a person on the uh, podcast last week. This guy was a former CIA agent and a former FBI agent. And he's talking about America's lost its way in America, this America that I said, you realize, I said, you know, I look up reviews on Yelp and I'll go to a restaurant and the reviews say bad things. And I'll go to this restaurant. I'll go, oh, this restaurant is this, this restaurant is that. I'm like 40 minutes. I'm in line trying to get a freaking Subway sandwich that they got. And I'm like, if this place is so bad, why is there 300 people here at lunchtime? Right. Oh, but it sucks. It's horrible. And then you go to another restaurant and the reviews are, this place is awesome. There's two people sitting there. Sure. So who's right and who's wrong? Maybe some enemies are saying bad things about the one that's kicking everyone's ass. But when you go into the restaurant, there's 40, you're 45 minute wait. Yeah, you're doing something right. America's got to wait. It took us 18 months to get a green card to come to America because we were trying to come to America when we escaped Iran. So, uh, look. The idea that America was founded on has crushed it and it's helped the world. And it allows a guy like me, who's Middle Eastern from Iran, from a broken family, 1.8 GPA, that I went to the Army, 101st Airborne Division, Air Assault. I was about to re-enlist to stay in for 20 years. One guy called me, encouraged me to get out. I got out. I got into sales, started going into financial services, got my Series 7, War Morgan Stanley Dean Witter. Started an insurance company, sold it for a few hundred, and boom, I'm sitting there saying, you got to be kidding me. This is the greatest country in the world. A regular guy like me can pull this off. This is awesome. More people need to know this stuff. You know, it, it, that story is going to be told over and over and over again. But I'll wrap up with this, Will. If people ask what the problem is, here's what the problem is. Hmm. When you talk to, when you watch a mother talk to the son, if the mother says things like, Look at this, um, you know, look at this person, what they do. Life is not all about money, son. You know, look at this person, what they're doing. Life is about this. Life is about that. You know, the, the, these people that are capitalists, these millionaires are bad people. They're greedy. They're bad people. And his 12-year-old son is looking at mommy saying, oh, my God, these rich people are bad, abusive. They are bad people. They're bad people, son. Never do that. Mom, I'll never be rich. You're right. I will never be rich to disappoint you. The son is not going to be rich to disappoint mommy. So if you look at that and, and the kid says, hey, hey, son, we're at a restaurant yesterday, Brazil restaurant in, in uh, Pompano. Mm. And we're eating the steakhouse. And the lady who's been waiting on us for the last nine months, we go there every Sunday to eat at this place. Nine months she waits on us and comes in. And she says, uh, you know, the other day I went on Instagram and I was following your stuff. And I really finally realized who you are, why everybody stops you when you come into the restaurant. I said, very cool. She says, you know, my husband is the owner. I said, oh, wow. Well, if he, is he ever here? I'd love to meet him. He said, what do you mean is he ever here? I said, yeah, I'd love to meet him. He says, he's always here. Which one's your husband? He's the guy that brings the short ribs for your dad. I said, he's the owner? Yeah. So he, you know how these guys, you go to these Brazilian, like Texas. Of course. Oh, I love it. I love it. Yeah. You and like. One of the guys that brings the meat to our, t he's the freaking owner of the place and his wife's the hostess. And I'm like, I sat there and I'm like, so I look at my kids. I'm like, son, I said, realize why the food here is better than the other Brazil place we go in Miami <laughs> because the owner's here every day. So you realize that's a Sunday. Exactly. This is his business. He can be home kicking it. He's here at the restaurant. You know how much we respect this man? Mm. So you see my son, he says, dad, I'd like to know his name. I said, ask the man his name. And so my son is now enamored right. because a person who owns a business as an operator is there on a Sunday serving us. Mm. What are you doing? You can say, I'm just a manager and not have to do that. That's why this restaurant is so amazing, Dylan, because great operators who run their businesses, customers keep showing up. It is very hard to do what he does. I respect him so much. So you have one mother that this is a businessman and a capitalist because they're rich. The son's never going to be that. The other say, you know, turning a businessman into a hero, my son's going to say, I'm going to one day start a business and I'm going to be a great operator. I'm going to take care of my customers because I want this kind of respect. Everything is about the hero making machine. We are turning the wrong people into heroes today. And those are the victims. We're no longer turning these people that 
risk their entire life savings to start a business. In many cases, 90% of the time, doesn't work out. Lose a house, lose their cars, lose their marriage, divorce. Running a business is so hard and risky. But we're not turning these people into heroes. We're saying they're greedy. They're bad. All they care about is Ferraris and Lambos. That perspective has confused the nation to realize, maybe I should be the complainer because I get more eyeballs. Maybe I should go out there and cry because I get more eyeballs. Rather than, no, you ought to go be a leader like this person that started a business. Our hero making machine has been screwed up the last few years. And that's why people are confused, specifically the youth. And what it comes down to 100% is out of the two people that you've just discussed, one will create incredible amounts of value outside of themselves, their family and their community and possibly the world. And another will simply possibly not do much. And, uh, I think that's a good way to finish everything. We will link. You have plenty of things for guys to check out. So I'm not even going to bother listening to them. Guys, we will list everything. Please go check out the podcast. Please go check out his YouTube channel. Please go check out all the stuff, the books. Plenty of, of stuff for anybody who's listening to this. Uh, if you enjoyed this podcast, there's way more for you guys to dig into. Patrick, I appreciate it, man. Hey, thanks for having me on, man. Really enjoyed it. Uh-huh.